Did you know we are halfway through the Gospel of Luke? Yeah, so as we get started on the second half, rather than starting with a joke today, don't moan, um, I'm going to start with, with something I've been kind of wanting to talk about before we get right into the text, and that is the nine different teaching methods that Jesus used. And uh, as I go through these kind of quickly, I'm going to also point out in the text today, in, in chapters 13 and 14, where he uses each of these. So, first of all, he speaks with authority. You know, he is the greatest preacher, teacher ever, and so we can learn some things from him, but none of us will have the authority that he has. He had authority, and often we see in the Gospels that it said the people were amazed at his teachings because they weren't like one of their scribes, but he taught as one who had authority. And truly, he had authority, and before he left this world, he said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and in earth, you know, and then he gave the Great Commission, so we know that he has authority. These other teaching methods we can remember and use. I know a lot of you teach in your churches. You teach Bible studies and vacation Bible school and, and uh, studies in your neighborhood. So we can all learn from these. You may just be teaching one person. Maybe you go home and you teach your husband a lesson or two. But uh, these, these are good teaching techniques. Okay, the second one that he uses are shocking words in hyperbole. He will use some exaggeration. He will get their attention, and we're definitely going to see this today. He'll say something, and you go, oh, did Jesus just say that? Now, it wasn't anything profane, but it's just something kind of a bit shocking. And it gets their attention, and he'll say things like, uh, I mean, like, for example, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And people are like, oh, really? You know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That's not in today's lesson. Hey, uh, before you criticize anybody else, get that log out of your eye. So he's speaking figuratively in shocking words to get their attention and to make a point. Another thing that he uses over and over is storytelling. Like last week, we saw the story he told about the Good Samaritan. He could have said when the man said, well, then who is my neighbor? He could have said, everybody. But no, he doesn't. He tells a story with such meaning that everybody, even people who are not Christians, are kind of familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. So he's a great storyteller. He also uses parables. And parables are these stories where he pulls spiritual truths from everyday life. And so they can relate to these things. He uses object and visual illustrations for example, when he <clears throat> washed the feet of the disciples, he was teaching them about servant leadership. He uh, doesn't just, um, uh, oh, another one he does is he will, he calls a child up and talk, says, unless you have the faith of a child, unless you come with childlike faith, you will not enter the kingdom of God. He saw the, the little widow putting in all that she had, two little coins, like two pennies, and he said she gave more than everyone. So he uses object and visual illustrations. He uh, uses a lot of repetition, and any good teacher knows you've got to repeat things. You can't just say it once. It needs to be repeated for people to get it in through our, you know, thick skulls and stick. And so he will repeat things. He frequently repeats things. Uh, he asked questions. So rather than just give answers, uh, he would often answer with a question. Other times he would ask them leading questions to help them understand the situation better. Questions stimulate critical thinking. And so he knows how to lead people in, into that critical thinking pattern. Memorable sayings. <clears throat> he used a lot of catchy phrases like ask, seek, knock, okay? He would say things like judge not, and that way you won't be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Things that stick with us. 
Uh, he created experiences. He gave the disciples instructions. He taught them. He gave them instructions. And then he sent them out to use those. You know, he, he called the 72 and he said, go out. Uh, don't take an extra bag or an extra shirt. Just take what you've got wherever you go. Stay at that house. If they don't accept you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. So he gave them instructions, but then he gave them the opportunity to go put it into practice and said, and when you come back, I want you to share what you've learned. And they did. And then uh, the ninth thing is he practiced what he preached. There is no greater example of a preacher following his own teachings than Jesus. He didn't just teach about prayer. He went away to pray. He prayed often. He didn't just teach about loving sinners. He loved sinners. He went to dinner with sinners. He lived a life that didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the walk all the way to the death, his death on the cross. Those are his main teaching methods. We could draw in a few others, but those are the main ones he used. And we're going to look for those as we go through these next two chapters. But first, we're going to pray. Oh, Holy Father, we love you with all our hearts. We thank you for your word, which is living and powerful. Oh, God, as we open your word now, open the eyes of our hearts that we may truly see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're halfway through Luke, and it's one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of see things in the same way, but they each add a little something different. And so these first 17 verses are not covered in any of the other gospels. They're, this is brand new material, and it's going to begin with a couple of shocking things. The first is something we could call an act of terrorism almost, and the second is what we could call a, a natural disaster. In both cases, a lot of people are killed, and the people are wondering, what happened? Was this due to sin, or was this just circumstances? And so Jesus is going to address that. In verse 1 it says, At that time, some people came and reported to him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he, Jesus, responded to them, Do you think these Galileans were more sinful than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? Because that's kind of what they were wondering. And he says, no, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. So I want to give you a little bit of historical background on this to, to help us understand it. And we've got a map up here on the screens uh, that of, of first century Holy Land. And uh, Rome is large and in charge at this point. It's not called Israel. They've divided it into provinces. And they have people in charge, Romans in charge of the provinces. So we've got Galilee up in the gold part, kind of in the northern section. Then Samaria. Okay, there were Jews in Galilee. In Samaria, that's where the Samaritans were. Kind of a mixed breed of Jews. And then in the south there, Judea in the brown that is where Jerusalem was, the temple. So when the Galileans, Jewish people, wanted to come to the temple in Jerusalem, which every male was required to do three times a year, they, ha they, ha they uh, would come, and the Galileans are here, and apparently what had happened is Pilate, who is the Roman governor, has killed some of the Galileans as they were giving their sacrifice at the temple. Their blood was commingled with the blood of their sacrifices. Why in the world would he do that? Well, Pilate, we know from other writings, and he's written about in the book of Josephus, and I, I have that here today, and I was reading a lot in it this week. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans, and uh, so his, 
His uh, history is a little bit slanted, but we still learn a whole lot from it. He talks a lot about uh, Pilate. He was a brutal man. Um, he was in charge of this area, though, of Judea. And he had a couple of places where he lived. One was Caesarea by the sea which was on the Mediterranean, and the other was in Jerusalem. And so uh, in this picture of the Temple Mount, uh, if we could have that, yeah. Okay, so there's the big, huge Temple Mount, about the size of 25 football fields, and the center of it is the temple. Uh, he was stationed, when he was in Jerusalem, in the Antonio Fortress, and that's on the northwestern corner. And so they could literally, the Romans that were stationed there, could literally look down on the Temple Mount area and see what the Jews were doing. They were put there on purpose to keep an eye on the Jews. It was called the Antonio Fortress because Herod the Great was friends with Mark Anthony. And so he named it after him, Antonio Fortress. And so <clears throat> any time the, the Jews were starting to get stirred up or worked up, they would step in. Here we have no example of them uh, in history, anything saying that these particular Galileans were doing anything. But there are some records that some of the zealots who were fighting against the Romans were from the area of Galilee. So perhaps these were some, or perhaps he just wanted to get at the Galileans, and this was a big way to do it. And so he, I mean, can you imagine you have come all this way to worship at the temple? You are giving your sacrifice, and as it is being sacrificed, you are sacrificed. And the blood commingled. It was horrific. And so he's saying here that he knows what they're thinking. Were these Galileans more sinful than the other Galileans because they suffered these things? And he clearly says no. This was not due to their sinfulness. I mean, really, it could be due to Pilate's sinfulness. Um, but, that, but that's some of the background here of... Philo is another guy that talks about, a historian that talks about Pilate, but he's spoken of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and even Paul writes about him in uh, 1 Timothy. Um, but he, he says something that seems kind of strange here. Unless you repent, you will all perish as well. I'm going to read a little further, and then I'll come back to that. Verse 4. Or those 18 that the tower in Siloam fell on and killed. Do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who live in Jerusalem? So Siloam is a section in Jerusalem, and there was a, a tall tower there, and it just happened to crumble, and 18 people, it fell on people, 18 people died. And so kind of a natural disaster there. We don't know if there was a bit of an earthquake that shook it or what. But he, you know, he's saying, do you think it's because they were more sinful than others? And he says that phrase again. He's using repetition here. So in this, in this first section, he's speaking with authority and he's using repetition. So the repetition is, again, in verse 5, no, I tell you, unless you repent you will all perish as well. So in both of these circumstances, we saw people uh, <clears throat> snuffed out with very little, if any, warning and for no apparent reason. Both of these events uh, lead us to realize how precarious our very existence is. And that's kind of what Jesus is implying. They did nothing wrong. Here, he specifically said that. But at any moment, something could happen to any one of us. It could be terrorism. It could be an act of nature. It could be something that destroys us from our own bodies. And so he says, unless you repent, you will all perish as well. So he did, 
he, um, in this repent or perish, he's saying no matter how or what happens, we should all be ready to face death at any moment, any time. Well, how can we be ready? Well, he's told us, repent. Repent. And in John 3, 16, we know that Jesus promises that those who believe in him will never perish, but have eternal life. So when we repent and believe, yeah, we may perish from this world, but only to be going on to a much better place. And so he gives that, you know, twice. Repent and you will all, or you will all perish as well. And you know like what I like to call that? Turn or burn. <laughs> yeah. Because the word repent means you're going one way, literally, and you have us turn and go back to God. You've gotten off track, turn back to God. So turn or burn. <sighs> yeah, he didn't say it that way. That's me. He's so much nicer than I am. Okay, so after that warning, now he's going to go into a parable, another of his teaching techniques. And as he does this, his parable, it says he, there was a man that had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he replied to him, Sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year. If, but if not, you can cut it down. So here we see uh, a fig tree, and that is uh, symbolic of the nation of Israel. And so it's a message kind of for the nation at that time, but it's also an, a message for individuals. And so I want us to take it today that this is a message for us as individuals. Are we producing fruit? Are we producing fruit? And what is, what is that? What do I mean by that? The good works that God has called us to do. We're not saved by works. We are saved by grace through faith. But once we're saved, we are called to do good works, and that's fruit. So um, <clears throat> this is speaking to us. Our lives should be producing good fruit. So God has been nurturing us. He's like the gardener. He has sent his son to garden us, to fertilize, to uh, make it so that it's possible for us to produce good fruit. But are we doing it? Now, God's patience is great. His patience is so great. His grace is so wonderful that often we get complacent. Like this fig tree just kind of hanging out, using up soil, but not really producing anything. Um, this gardener's efforts um, help us see the urgency in this tree of it needs to get with it get going and, and produce something. It's a, it's a state of grace and of urgency. Sometimes we need to feel that sense of urgency in our lives. We've been sitting too long and no fruit. We need to get, we need to get with, uh, with the program there. So he's, he's telling people that, remember on the heels of this, unless you repent, you will perish. Okay, so if you re even if you repent, you, then start producing fruit. Verse 10, as he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman who was there who had been disabled by a spirit or had a spirit of infirmity, your translation may say, for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, I think at some point we've all had a backache. If you haven't, well... Just, you need a little more time. <laughs> Back aches hurt, don't they? And can you imagine this woman, her back not only hurt, but she was bent over. Not for 18 days, that would be awful. And not for 18 months, but for 18 years. 
can't even imagine how awful that was. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, wrote this. For 18 years, she had not gazed upon the sun. For 18 years, no star of night had gladdened her eye. Her face was drawn downward toward the dust, and all the light of her life was dim. She walked about as if she were searching for a grave, and I do not doubt she often felt that it would have been gladness to have found one. A state of despair, a state of pain and sadness until Jesus showed up. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called out to her, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. So he spoke a word of both uh, authority, again, to this woman and of compassion. He also laid his hands on her, giving her a compassionate touch. <clears throat> but the leader of the synagogue was thrilled to death. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> the leader of the synagogue was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Responding about, he responded by saying to the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman. So we know the cause. We've seen a lot of demonic activity so far in uh, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated. But the whole crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things he was doing. So, um, there are many causes uh, of disease and problems, and uh, sometimes it's no fault of our own. Other times, we can bring trouble on ourselves, can't we? Even on our own bodies. We don't know what the case here was, except that it did come from Satan. And, but the good news is that Jesus is more powerful than Satan. He's more powerful than sickness or disease or sin. He has the power to heal and the power to save. Um, the ruler of the synagogue criticizes him. He gets put down and the crowd loves it. There are seven sabbatical healings that Jesus does that we read about in the Gospels. So that's it's very interesting. He, could, he can heal people any day of the week and he does. But he makes a point of doing it on the Sabbath to teach the teachers that doing good is a good thing to do on the Sabbath. That healing is great on the Sabbath. And then he goes into another couple of little parables here in verse 18. Um, he said, therefore... What is the kingdom of God like, and what shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky rested in its branches. So uh, this parable and the next, we read about them in, the other, in Matthew and Mark also. And there are different points of view. Scholars disagree on what this can be. That the, the seed of God, most of them think that's the word of God because we've seen that in, in several other parables. Uh, but that it was planted and it grew big and that's the church. Others would say, yeah, that's it to, in a sense. But the birds who come in, because remember the parable of the four seed, seeds? The birds came and, and snatched the seeds. And later in his explanation, he said, that's the devil snatching the word of God away from those so that they won't hear it and take it in deep. And so they say, 
the church grows, but then it's infiltrated by evil. And so we do have to be aware of that, truly. And this second little parable, verse 20, and again he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. So again, um, when we see leaven in the Bible, and we've seen it over and over in this kind of an illustration, it's usually pointing to sin, often to the sin of pride, which starts little and then gets puffed up. But it also shows how sin can spread quickly and permeate even that which is good and that we need to be aware of that. Verse 22. He went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. So he's gone to Jerusalem his whole life, three times a year because he's a good Jew. He would go there for festivals. But this is his... We are on now his last trip to Jerusalem. This will end up eventually with him being uh, crucified. So he's on his way and he's hitting every little town and village he can along the way. He is working, spreading the good news, teaching, healing all the way. Verse 23, Lord, someone asked him, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because I tell you, many will try and enter and won't be able. Once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up for us. He will answer, I don't know you or where you're from. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught, a, you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south to share in the banquet in the kingdom of God. Note this. Some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. So he's giving this teaching, and he starts off talking about the narrow door. And that's something he talked about uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 7, where he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are meant are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few so this is a common thing theme that he brings up here and he's given like an object or illustration here one of his teaching techniques everybody knows what a narrow gate and a wide gate looks like right And so he's saying, hey, make every effort to enter through that narrow gate. Yeah, it'll be a little trickier. It'll be a little harder. The wide gate, oh, that's broad. That's easy. And hey, if you're on the path that everybody's doing it, everybody's going that way and it's easy, time to change paths, okay? (laughs) Get off the broad, easy path. Get on the straight and narrow. Um, Make every effort. To be on it, he says here, and the word for that, make every effort, it comes from a Greek word, agonizo, agonizomi, my Greek is so good, um, which means like agonize over it. We like to think that, oh, if we get on God's path, it's going to be easy, easy breezy, you know? Oh, I've given my life to Jesus, so I'm not going to have any more problems. It's all going to be smooth and blessings. And no, that's not what Jesus promised, did he? He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, trials, problems. But then he goes on to say, but you're with me and I've overcome the world. So the end is victorious. The end is great, but that doesn't mean every day of your life is going to be smooth and easy. He, he doesn't promise that, but he does promise to be with us. That if we are his, he will never leave us or forsake us. 
So this narrow path, and they're wondering, okay, so are there just a few, they've asked, who are going to be saved? And it seems like a few, but you know what? It's, it's going to be more than a few. Because in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, John gets this revelation of Jesus Christ who tells him all about the end times. And in chapter 7 of Revelation, it says, um, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So yes, there's going to be a lot of us there in the end because it's going to accumulate over time. We're gonna, there will be many of us, all colors, all tribes, all nations. It's, it will be wonderful. <clears throat> and we don't get there, when I say again, uh, by agonizing, and it's not going to be evil, and make every effort. Again, it's not by works. We're saved by grace through faith. But it, is, it can be a difficult Time And his disciples are going to see how difficult that's going to be as, you know, all but John will be martyred for their faith. I want to read this passage now in the message, which is a more easy to understand uh, Eugene Peterson translation, starting in Luke 13, 24. Just kind of listen or you can read along. Put your mind on your life with God. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. A lot of you are going to assume that you'll sit down to God's salvation banquet just because you've been hanging around the neighborhood all your lives. I've been in church. I've been in Sunday school. I went to Mary Ministries. How did I end up here instead of heaven? You know? Well, one day you're going to be banging on the door, wanting to get in, but you'll find the door locked and the master saying, Sorry, you're not on the guest list. You'll protest. But we've known you all our lives, only to be interrupted with his abrupt, your kind of knowing can hardly be called knowing. You don't know the first thing about me. That's when you'll find yourselves out in the cold, strangers to grace. You'll watch Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets march into God's kingdom. You'll watch outsiders stream in from the east, west, north, and south. In other words, not just from Israel, not just Jews, but from all over. Stream in and sit down at the table of God's kingdom. And all the time you'll be outside looking in, wondering what happened. This is called the great reversal. The last in line, put at the head of the line, and the so-called first ending up last. And that's another of his catchy phrases that he uses. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. But here we have, and remember Luke's writing this, the only Gentile author of a book of the Bible is writing this. And he's making it clear to the Gentiles who will be reading this that they're also going to be invited to be a part of God's kingdom. From the east, west, north, and south. Um, There's going to be people who have been very close to salvation, who've had the opportunity to hear the word of God, who have been around the people of God, and yet they've never made a commitment. They've never in their hearts said, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. I confess him as Lord of my life. I believe he died for my sins, rose from the grave, and is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. They've never really trusted in that and then they're going to be going yeah I I believe that hey the Bible says even demons believe but have they committed their lives to him no so it's more than believing about Jesus it's putting your faith and trust in Jesus verse 31 at that time some Pharisees came and told him go get out of here Herod wants to kill you Okay, so this Herod would be Herod Antipas. Herod the Great has died. This is one of his sons who's in charge at, the, at this time. He is the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And they're going, go, hey, hey. There, he's getting close to Jerusalem. Go, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go tell that fox, look, 
I'm driving out demons and performing healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will complete my work. Yet it is necessary that I travel today, tomorrow, and the next day because it is not possible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. So here are these Pharisees who are coming to warn him. Now, now are these good, some of the good Pharisees? There were some good Pharisees. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and probably several others that were unnamed. Are they giving him warning? Are these some of the Pharisees who just don't want him going to the temple and hanging around with this big mob, this big crowd. We don't know. Could be either way. Either way, they're saying, look, he's not worried. He's saying, oh, you go tell Herod, that old fox, that I'm driving out. Hey, I've got a job to do and I'm going to keep doing it. This is what he's basically saying here. Um, as he gets closer to Jerusalem, in verse 34, he laments over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is abandoned to you. I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here he is grieving over Jerusalem. Um, on the Mount of Olives, on the, on the uh, west side, faces, uh, 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 you, you see the Temple Mount. And about halfway up the Mount of Olives, on the Palm Sunday Trail, there is a church that's referred to as the Church of the Tears. Because it has these four little pinnacles, and on it it looks like a big teardrop at the top of each one of them. And that's the place that commemorates, we don't know where Jesus was when he, when he said this, but uh, uh, Matthew also talks about this, and, and uh, that Jesus there and weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And it is down that same path that he will come later in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And um, again... Uh, he will recognize the sadness as he looks at Jerusalem, which for the most part rejected him. But what were they saying that day on Palm Sunday? Oh, yes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying the very words that he said they would say, and it's a quote from the book of Psalms. Luke 14. One Sabbath, here we go again. When he w went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. Now, it's interesting to me that he accepted this invitation uh, to a Pharisee because in general, they did not like him. But then as I got to thinking about it, I thought, you know what? He never did turn down a dinner opportunity. He said yes to every invitation to eat that he received. And a couple of times he even invited himself. I think it's next week or the following week we'll be reading about Zacchaeus. He goes, hey, come on down. I'm going to your house today, you know. Uh, so here he accepts his invitation to go eat. And uh, he's, he gets there. And there in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. Your translation may say a man who had dropsy. And we would call that edema today. It's a medical uh, term which is an unusual accumulation of fluid in the body. It's very, uh, can be very deadly. <clears throat> in response... Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Okay, so in response, they hadn't even asked him a question, but he knows what's on their minds because we've seen that over and over that he knew what they were thinking. And so he probably knows this is a setup. They've invited me here for dinner and they've invited this guy here. It's the Sabbath. They know I've been healing on the Sabbath and they don't think it's right. So they're going to see if I'm going to do it again. So I'm just going to put it back to them. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Verse 4. Um, and that's why he's using what technique? The asking of questions. Uh, but they kept silent. 
he took the man, healed him, and sent him away. And to them he said, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They could find no answer to these things. He's going, yeah, if your kid fell in a well, are you going to, and he's going, dad, dad, let me out, help me out. You going to leave him in there on this because it's a Sabbath? No, you wouldn't even leave your ox in there or your, in a ditch or your donkey, much less your child. Here is a person who is in need of healing. It's okay to heal on the Sabbath, but they're not going to open their mouth. They're not going to say yes or no. They're just going to be silent. Verse 7. He told a parable to those who were invited and when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. Okay, so he's looking around at the people who are there. And uh, yeah, the closer you sat to the host, the more important you must be. Okay, and the further out you are, well, you aren't that important. Okay, so he's looking around at this situation. He says in verse 8, when you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit at the place of honor because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come in and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So he's teaching here um, uh, about uh, humility and honor. And uh, really, this was not a new teaching to them. These people should have known this because in Proverbs chapter 25, written by King Solomon, we read this. Do not exalt yourself in the king's presence. and Do not claim a place among his great men. It is better for him to say, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. So they should have known that teaching. Jesus certainly did, and he's reteaching it. He often does that. He teaches something that the prophets or the Psalms or something they should all know already. Jesus knew the scriptures because he is the word. He is also a person who, what did we say, practices what he preaches. And so he lived a life of humility so great. And um, the Apostle Paul writes this about Jesus in Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And that's what we should do. We should have the mind of Christ as believers. Who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had become as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God had, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he lived it out. He didn't come going, hey, I'm king, I'm Messiah, I'm great, come worship me. No, he came humbly, put on flesh and blood. Came as a servant, a very, very humble servant and gave his life. He walked the walk. Verse 12. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, 
lame or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, when I was reading and studying that this week, I was very convicted by this because I thought how often when we have friends over, it's just people, you know, like us and they're people that are our friends we enjoy. Am I looking for someone who is needy, who is physically hurting, who is in bad shape, who can't repay me? And not that I'm expecting my friends to have me over, uh, just because I had them over. That's, that's not what I'm looking for at all. But I thought, you know, convicted right here. I need to be looking for those who need uh, a hand up, who need a little extra love and attention, or maybe a little prayer for healing. Um, and that's what he's saying, you know, invite those who, who can't pay you back. Verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he told him, and so here comes another parable story. A man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they began to make excuses. The first one said to him, "Uh, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I just got married and therefore I am unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. So the custom in those days was to send out two invitations. One initially, kind of like a save the date. Hey, we're going to be having a big party, a big banquet. You're going to be invited to it. And then when it was time for that banquet, it would go out again. Okay, now's the time, so come on in. And everybody's making excuses. Uh, I just bought some land. Oh, I'm busy at work. Oh, I just got married and the wife needs me. You know, it's all kinds of, of things, just life, just life. And so they're declining. And it's kind of like people do today. Jesus has said, I'm throwing a big party. It's going to be a banquet in heaven. Everybody's invited. You're invited. Come on. And some people are going, you know, I'm... Maybe, when I, maybe later on in life, I'll have a little more time. Uh, let me, uh, or let me sow my wild oats first, and then I'll turn to Jesus. I, I'm so busy right now, I can't even think about committing my life to anything else, much less the Lord, because he wants my whole life. And so he's going, just keep inviting, just keep going out to those that the world sees as not even worthy the poor, the hurting, people along the, you know, the homeless on the side of the road. Invite them all. Invite them all in. Verse 25. Now, great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, great crowds. We've seen this all along the way. People just keep coming to Jesus. Some of them are coming legitimately. They've heard about him. They want to uh, uh, see if he is the Messiah, if he is this. Others are like, it's, this is like the traveling show. I want to I see the show. I want to see some miracles. I want to see some magic. 
I want to see what's happening. So not everybody that's in this crowd is believing in Jesus. Some are. But it's a big crowd. And he turns and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So what technique? Is he using here, but shocking words, hyperbole. He's exaggerating somewhat as he's saying, hate your parents and your family. Uh, why would he say that? Because he's already said, okay, love everybody, love even your enemies. Well, he's getting their attention. This is an attention grabber, right? Hate your parents. <laughs> They're going like, what? But they, he's making an appointment. Uh, a uh, point of in comparison to your love for me. It should be like you're hating them. There should be that kind of a difference. If you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, if you put me first in comparison to that, our love for Jesus Christ should be supreme. It should be above all else. And that's hard, isn't it? I mean, especially if you have grandkids. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. We've all got those people in our lives that we just love so dearly, but really they cannot be above Jesus. He is supreme. He is supreme. So he's making this, and he says, you know, hey, if you can't uh, bear your own cross, you, ca you cannot be my disciple. Yeah, it can cause family div divisions, can it? When we, uh, sometimes when we get totally sold out to Jesus, it can cause problems in the family because not everybody in the family may believe what we believe and it can cause some strife. Are you, are you willing to even have that? Francis Schaeffer, who is a, uh, deceased now, but uh, was a great teacher and writer, Christian, uh, tells about a, a, becoming a believer as a teenager, and he did not grow up in a Christian home, and uh, came to a point when he was like a senior in high school, he wanted to uh, go into ministry, and he goes and he talks to his father about it, and his father is totally against it. Totally against it. No, I don't want you to do that. Don't want you to do that. What well, comes down to time for him to really make the college decision? And he says, you know, he talks to his father about it again. His father says, no. He said, well, I'm going to go down into the cellar and I'm going to pray about it. And so Francis Shaver goes down into the, to the cellar and he prays and prays. And he says, okay, God, I don't usually pray like this, but I'm going to flip a coin. And if it's, if it's heads, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. And if it's tails, I'll do what my dad wants me to do. <clears throat> so he flips it and it's heads. And he said, okay, God, I'm going to ask you to be patient with me. I want to flip it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and this time, if it's tails, I'll do what you want me to do. And if it's heads, I'll do what my dad wants me to do. And so he flips it one more time, and it's tails. And he said, okay, God, just please, one more time. Just one more time. I just want to be sure before I cause this division with my dad. So I will go back to heads. If it's heads, I'll do what you want me to do. And he flips it the last time, and it's heads again. And he said, thank you for being patient with me. I'm going to go up, and I'm going to tell my dad. And so he goes up out of the cellar, and he tells his dad, he said, Dad, I've given this thought. I've prayed about it, and I'm going into ministry. And his dad got mad and started yelling and was walking out the door, and before the do right before the door slammed, he said, Okay, but I'm only paying for the first semester. <laughs> it was years later before his dad gave his life to Jesus, but he did. And Francis felt like that was the turning point that made him start thinking about, about it because his son was so sold out that he was willing to do whatever.
to go and follow Jesus. So, you know, there are times when it can cause a division and our actions in following Jesus. And, you know, I think we need to be loving through it all. He was loving to his father. He respected his father through it all. If he had then said, I'm not having anything to do with you after the first semester, he didn't. He continued to love on his father and to spend time with him. And so his father saw, okay, this wasn't just a young boy making a rash decision. He's lived this out for years now. Touched his heart. Touched his heart. Let's keep going. Verse 28. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king is going to go to war against another king will not first come and sit down and decide if he is able uh, with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes after him with 20,000. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. So he's creating some experiences here, saying, okay, I want you to consider the cost of this, of being my disciple. Or consider the cost, like if you're building a tower, like if you're go a king going to war, consider it all, and then are you willing to give all you have? in order to follow me. Now, he doesn't call everyone to give up everything they have. But are you willing to give up all that you have? Are you willing to? That's what, he, that's what he's asking here. Again, the message puts it like this in Luke 14, 33. Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, then you can't be my disciple. And what is a disciple? We've been talking about that a lot. A follower, a pupil of Jesus. Following him. And then he gives us these last couple of verses here, verse 34. Now, salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Let, someone, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. And we've heard that little catchy phrase over and over. If you have ears to hear, listen. Okay, so why is this here? Well, salt was very, very important to, in the first century and in the ancient days period because uh, not only does salt enhance the flavor of foods, but it's a natural preservative. So if they had meat and they weren't able to roast it immediately, they needed to pack it in salt to preserve it. Okay, that kept it from rotting. Uh, salt also served as a disinfectant and as an antiseptic. It would kill germs, and they would literally pour salt on wounds. Yeah, that stings, but it kills the germs. It kills germs. How many of you, your mother has told you, when you've got a sore throat, what do you need to do? Gargle with warm salt water, and it works, doesn't it? Yeah, it really helps. You get a sinus infection, your doctor says, get that, you know, salty spray and squirt it up your sinuses and rinse your nose out. It kills germs. We know that. So did you know this, though? Because I was reading more about salt. Did you know that salt is good to get rid of bad breath? Yeah. It gets the smell of onion off, the, off your hands. You cut an onion, you got rub salt on it. Uh, we all know that soaking in a tub of Epsom salt makes you, your muscles feel better. Did you know it can be a fertilizer? I did not know this. You can't put salt on all, but, but you could get Epsom salt. And this is on uh, aisle 54 at Home Depot <laughs> over here at 59 in Williams Trace. I was looking at it yesterday. I thought, is this really real? I'm reading this. I, yeah, there is salt fertilizer. And it's good. It keeps the plants from going yellow. Um, but like I say, not all salt is good for all plants, so you want to read about that. Salt is also a stain remover and a cleanser. 
And this one, make note of this, this is really important. To remove pin feathers easily from a chicken. <laughs> Rub the chicken skin with salt first and then the feathers come out real easily. You laugh, but you know, raising chickens and eggs is becoming pretty popular. If you want organic chickens, and if you're not happy with Chick-fil-A, you know, you might want to consider this, going into this business here. Now you know how to get the pin feathers out. Okay, salt prevents mold. It helps you clean spinach and other leafy veggies faster. I didn't know that. I always get the pre-washed spinach because if you get that fresh spinach, it's so hard to get all the dirt off. Sprinkle salt on it and it'll wash on off. I haven't tried it, but... <laughs> okay, um, but if salt is not stored properly, it can be ruined. It loses its value, it's useless. Okay, so why is he talking about salt and what does that have to do with us? Um, let's see what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So what kind of salt are you? Because we're called to be the salt of the earth. What does that mean? We are to add flavor to this world and we are to be a preservative. We are to help prevent the infection of sin in this world. We are to be a healing agent. We are to help cleanse the stain of sin. We are to help get rid of the stench, the smell of sin. We are to be spread like fertilizer, helping that which is good to grow and become fruitful. We can be very, very useful, or we can be totally useless, not producing fruit. Uh, salt also makes one thirsty. And so let's make people thirst for the Word of God. That's the kind of salt we are called to be. So what have we seen today in the inerrant word of God? Several things. Repent or perish. Be fruitful. Take the narrow door. Be humble. Do good to those who cannot repay you. Count the cost of discipleship. And be the salt of the earth. God's word is so practical. It's so life-changing. Take it in and live it out. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of grace and that you are so patient with us. Lord, help us to not get complacent in this world, but to... Be the salt that you have called us to be. Um, may we add the flavor and stop the spread of sin. May we be truly fruitful and useful. And may we lead others, O oh God, to you, to your son Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.